our brother and our fellow HU alum and HU community member, Abdul Rahman Muhammad. And uh, we're gonna talk to him about his piece. The lead, he's the lead investigative journalist for Who Killed Malcolm X airing on Netflix right now. Brother, welcome. Welcome, Brother Alphonse. Uh, mm -hmm. I appreciate the invitation. And uh, to you, Maria, and my very fine Howard University family, it's a great pleasure and privilege to come before the Capstone Group. And uh, it's a really um, gratifying invitation, and I, and I thank you. So let, let's start, um, if we can, with Howard University. Tell us about briefly about your time at Howard and how it helped to, uh, to set you on your path. Well, I entered Howard in 1980. I entered the class of uh, 1984. Uh, again, I have a bachelor's in philosophy from the uh, Department of, well, at that time it was liberal arts, arts and sciences now. Um, very active on campus and took part in many of the uh, very vibrant activities that you would find at a very spe special place like Howard University, uh, all different uh, organizations and activities uh, on campus. I was very uh, um, involved in, you know, HUSA and different uh, political movements that were afoot on the campus at that time. And uh, it was a very enriching experience for me, as it as it is for all of us. Okay. All right. Well. Your background, as you said, was in philosophy. Um, how does a philosopher, a philosophy student, and somebody who studies all of these different doctrines and, and, and ideals and maybe even religions, how do you find yourself a filmmaker um, putting together a production that, um, and that's funny because in your bio, I didn't see filmmaker <laughs> and I didn't see documentarian, but you have put a show on Netflix. Uh, tell us about you know, mounting the production and how this happens? Well, to, you know, to tell the full story, I am the, the lead investigative uh, scholar on this piece, but this was really uh, the effort of a production company. Uh, I was approached by a group called Arc Media, who was brought to their attention through their development people, uh, primarily through the work that I did with Dr. Manning Marable and the, uh, his um, um, superb biography of Malcolm X, A Life of Reinvention, that I appeared in. And he gave me credit in that work for exposing the shotgun assassin of Malcolm X, a man we know now as William X. Bradley, who went on to become Al Mustafa Shabazz. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Marable passed away three days before that book was published. And, um, you know, it was such a shocking revelation uh, that they wanted to know, you know, who was this gentleman who contributed to this, uh, to this piece? 2010, I wrote a quite extensive article on this man, uh, William Bradley, Al Mustafa Shabazz. And in fact, that was the first time in that article that the man's face had ever been seen in the public and identified um, as the man who pulled the trigger that took the life of our brother, that El Haj Malik El Shabazz Malcolm X. So uh, this production company approached me after many, many years of trying to get this to the screen. Uh, I was at the time writing a book on it and I had many, many uh, setbacks and broken promises and uh, it was a really uh, heartbreaking ex experience because, again, I exposed the man in 2010 and he didn't get it to the screen until, you know, uh, October of last year. So mm -hmm. Arc Media approached me and they said, we want to do this project. Uh, Miss Rachel Dredson, Phil Burdison, they were actually the directors. And uh, we had... Shayla Harris from the New York Times and Naila Sims who uh, worked with Oprah. This was the team uh, that brought this to Fusion Television and then ultimately purchased by Netflix. Okay, 
Okay. So um, you were approached through your work. I mean, somebody recognized your work and thought that, you know, what you did was not only worthwhile, but would add something to the lore and to the stories and the things that we'd already heard. What happened uh, was I was appearing in, you know, all the major newspapers, New York Times, mm. Washington Post, Newark Star Ledger, Abdul Rahman Muhammad, but no one knew who I was. <laughs> No one, knew, like they were looking around, what university does he teach at? You know, surely this man must be, you know, a tenured professor at some university. And uh, I was just a ghost as far as, you know, these production people were concerned. Mm -hmm. So uh, inquiries were made in the scholarly community and uh, that where they found out, you know, that yes, this man really is, uh, you know, an authority on this subject. You need to talk to him. Well, it's one thing to be an authority on a subject. It's another thing to have somebody sit down and use your book or your writings or interview you. But you are the prime person in this special. You carry the weight of the whole thing. And, um, and you do it adroitly. Um, it seems like, you know, this was second nature to you because of the conviction and the amount of time that you put into it. Could you, could you speak real quickly before we get into the actual program about um, the role, did they say to you, well, this is what it's going to be. You're going to be on screen most of the time. And, um, and this is what we need from you. Were you at all intimidated by that? Um, no, I wasn't intimidated because um, I had prepared for it, you know. And that's what I would say to anyone who would want to get a production of this magnitude. This was about a million and a half dollar production. Mm. And uh, before they put someone on the screen with that type of budget, um, they do an extensive background check on you, you know, and they have to make sure that you're the real deal and that they can uh, put you on the screen and you're going to be credible and there's not going to be any type of surprises or anything that would uh, <laughs> diminish the credibility of the piece. But no, I was prepared. I was ready. I had been preparing for, you know, many, many years for this okay. type of uh, production for this moment. And, uh, you know, I just caught a break. Did you set the tone for how you started and, and what you felt was um, was the environment uh, that you were that you were stepping into, really diving into? Because um, it was it was somewhat dangerous, bro. It wasn't somewhat dangerous. It was very dangerous. <laughs> um, and in fact, um, you no, know, you asked me about my background in philosophy. It's philosophy that teaches you to ask the big questions and to uh, follow the logic wherever it takes you, you know, mm. and um, to be detached and uh, subjective when you examine any type of question. So that's really, you know, my philosophy background gave me what you would call the courage to pursue this, uh, this story. Um, you're right. The reason that it took 55 years to learn, you know, definitively who fired the weapon, that took the life of Malcolm X is because uh, there was an inherent danger to uh, whatever investigator who would want to take this on. The very famous African-American journalist, uh, Les Payne, who just passed away just a few years ago, uh, he was working on a book on Malcolm X, and this was going to be a very important chapter in that work, Who Killed Malcolm X, chapter on the assassination, and it was his desire to go into Newark and to do exactly, I guess, what I did. And uh, a message came back to Les Payne, anyone coming into Newark looking for the assassins of Malcolm X will not leave. Mm. How so, long ago was you know, that? It took many, you know, um, I had to be very careful. You'll see in the series how I asked the questions. You kind of have to dance around it and just kind of let people talk. And, um, you know, once they get, you know, in the groove and they become loquacious and, and they just start, uh, you know, just sharing different things with you, they'll give you a nugget, you know, a mm. piece of the puzzle that mm. you can connect to the other pieces that you have, you know, confirm it in the documents, and then you kind of get the whole picture of exactly what took place. Mm. Well, it's interesting because in the work that you did, we are, and I don't want to speak for everybody, but a lot of us are familiar with the surface story, with the story about what happened the night that he was shot. Um, but a lot of us are not familiar 
with the different roles that were played, not only by the police department, not only by the FBI, but also by the Nation of Islam. Could you tell me about how you uncovered this whole internecine plot and how these individuals, even though they weren't necessarily all working together, they, they fit together like pieces to a puzzle? Yes, what we showed in the, in the series is that there was an intersection, you know, that's the, that's the word in academia right now, intersectionality. There was an intersection of interest between the uh, corrupt and evil FBI under the leadership of J. J. Edgar Hoover, uh, the New York City Police Department, and the Nation of Islam. They all had their own reasons for wanting to uh, extinguish the voice of Malcolm X, and they all had, uh, I guess, mutual interest in accomplishing that. Um, they're all equally guilty, as far as I'm concerned, and as far as the historians that uh, you see in the series, they're all equally guilty from the FBI and their bag of dirty tricks, their COINTELPRO counterintelligence program that created division, suspicion, jealousies, and hostilities between members of the Nation of Islam Elijah Muhammad's family and Malcolm X, um, the, the New York City Police Department that knew that Malcolm's life was in mortal danger and stood back and let it happen. And of course, the Nation of Islam, who were the uh, actual trigger men who carried out the dastardly deed. Can you talk about that atmosphere when you went and got this information and interviewed these people even years later, how they talked to you? And how they dealt with you? Well, this many years later, they're not really that much concerned about it. Uh, I must say that by the time I published my findings, which was about 10 years ago, the assassination of Malcolm X was pretty much a dead letter. Um, I'm not the only one who's done research in the assassination of Malcolm X. Uh, there's about a handful of scholars who uh, and mostly independent scholars, uh, with the exception of uh, Dr. Manning Marable, um, Dr. Zach Kondo, uh, there are many, uh, well, a few others uh, who were examining the question, about a handful of us. And um, by the time uh, I published my findings, uh, I don't think anyone was really concerned of, about, about me because it was a dead letter, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, it was frozen in the history books, just like we had one of the brothers say in the series, he said, hey, it's in the history books. The assassination of Malcolm X, we don't dwell on that. And mm -hmm. no one was dwelling on it, you know, up to, you know, 10 years ago. Uh, a lot of what we've known, we've known since the late 70s, early 80s. We just didn't know who actually carried it out. You know, we had some names that were floating around for 40 years. Uh, but they were abstractions. No one had identified who these who these individuals actually were. And, uh, you know, that's my contribution uh, to the scholarship, was that I actually put faces to the names of those people in the documents. Can you take me through the, that last um, chapter in the... Uh... In, in, in the piece and in your, your research and how you presented it and how you came to this conclusion and, and then even the way that you felt um, when you got there and weren't able to really seal the deal and sit down and look at this man and talk to him. I wanted to confront him face to face. I really did. Um, he probably wouldn't have uh, agreed to any type of interview or uh, even uh, answering any questions, you know, but I wanted it on camera. I wanted to document this man's reaction when confronted with uh, the fact that we know now. We know you did it. Why did you do it? How do you live with yourself? How do you sleep at night? How do you carry this with you every day, knowing that you're the one that's responsible for taking this great warrior from our people? How do you, you know, how do you even sleep at night? How do you, um, how do you process that every day? How do you move through life knowing that, you know, you're guilty of what you're guilty of and what people say you committed? And, uh, but of course, I didn't, I didn't get that chance. Um, that was the next phase in the series. I mean, we were on our way 
to knock on his door. We had his address, uh, you know, uh, had a very fine home there in a, in a, in a comfortable section of Newark. And uh, right before we, we got that opportunity, uh, I got word that he passed away and it just knocked me down, man. It just, just knocked me down. And you even see it in, in the series. I, I mean, I'm just totally stunned and um, quite, uh, quite despondent, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And you look deflated. Yeah, you look deflated. And I saw it coming. Oh. You and I had a really brief conversation um, about the interview process and what we were going to do. But I told you when I saw it, I was like, oh, no. Oh, no. And I felt it coming. You know, I, and that's great storytelling. You know, you feel the build and you're looking for a payoff emotionally one way or the other. And then when, when you weren't able to sit down and talk to this man, um, I felt it um viscerally i just i felt what you were going through you know what was um, so painful about it is that i you know i had been researching it for so many years and you know for decades literally for decades i couldn't get anyone interested you know in publishing the story it mm -hmm. wasn't really until the invention of blogs that i was able to publish his name because um you know the legal teams of all the major publications in america their lawyers were telling them, we can never publish this. This man has not been convicted and mm. we're not about to open ourselves up to a libel suit. So mm. what I did was I published his identity on my blog and I did not use the word alleged. I said, you know, let the historical record reflect that the man pictured above William Bradley, also known as Al Mustafa Shabazz, is the shotgun assassin of Malcolm X. I did not use the word allegedly. And I was kind of hoping he'd sue me because then I could do a discovery and perhaps get the case reopened, but that did not happen. But again, mm -hmm. until the invention of blogs where you could take your material directly to the public, mm -hmm. I couldn't even get you know any reputable uh, publishing outfit to even touch it. Um, I wanted to know since we have the information, everyone knows who the person uh, is that, that pulled the trigger, uh, what else is needed to open the case back up? I mean, I know you said you accused him and you was waiting for him to sue you, but isn't there enough information, enough cooperating evidence now to open the case back up? Uh, well, that's, what, that's what's being examined right now. Um, bear in mind that... Um, these assassins, Bradley, they're all deceased now. The main guy. So in terms of the uh, in terms of the culprit, there's no way to bring anyone to justice at this point because they've all passed away, with the exception of Cal McHair, uh, the only convicted assassin, the confessed assassin. He did, you know, close to 40 years in prison for the crime. The other four are deceased. What we're doing now is we're trying to get uh, Brother Muhammad Abdulaziz exonerated, and that's the only justice that's going to come at this point. And, um, you know, that's being worked on right now, and it, it appears that that will happen. I can't talk a lot about that legal case, but, um, you know, that's the only justice we're going to get right now. And he should get that justice, you know. He should be exonerated. He's 81 years old, and he shouldn't have to go to his grave with that stigma and bearing that cross, so to speak, you know, it's it, you know, it's it's you know, it's the least that they can do. It's the least that they can do. Is there any tie-in to the FBI that came out that can be shown that it was not just the Muslims, but it was a widespread conspiracy? Well, there was a conspiracy um, by virtue of the fact that the FBI's dirty hand was in. Uh, involved in creating the division, the jealousies, the rivalries, the suspicions. Uh, they were planting false articles. They had, uh, you know, completely saturated the Nation of Islam and Malcolm's organization with informants. Um, the, day of, the day Malcolm was assassinated, there were nine FBI informants in the Autobahn ballroom. None of them were called to the stand during the trial in 1966, nor was Gene Roberts, the undercover boss agent, uh, police officer for the Bureau of Special Services 
an investigation mentioned earlier, Malcolm's right-hand man, his security man, was a New York City police officer, undercover, and he's the one who gave Malcolm, uh, you know, mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. So none of those people, none of those officers were called to the stand uh, during the trial. So yes, the hand of the, of, the, of the feds is involved, the New York City Police Department, who stood back, had no police there that day. There were only two police officers way in the back of the building, nowhere near the scene. And uh, they knew it was going to go down. Uh, at least we, you know, I think we've proven circumstantially that they knew it was going to go down and they did nothing to stop it. And, uh, and of course, the Nation of Islam. But we did show this as well, that by the summer of 1965, the federal government, the feds, the FBI, they knew the identity of Bradley. They knew who he was and refused to turn him over to the New York City Police Department to be tried, to the district attorney, and put him on trial. They, they protected him. They protected him. And the, reason, and the question becomes, <clears throat> why was this man protected? You know, was this man uh, an FBI informant? Okay, was he working for the feds? Was he paid? Um, you know, these are questions that will remain for, for scholars uh, once more documents are revealed. Uh, but I will say this, in 1968, William Bradley and two other men carried out a bank robbery in Livingston, New Jersey. And Bradley was the shotgun uh, man in that crime. One of those men went to prison and Bradley was released. He was not uh, convicted. Now, let me share this with you. I believe it's five years just for owning a sort of shotgun, never mind firing it, you know, at a, you know, in a bank robbery. But he was let go. The question is, was this man protected? You know, was he straight up feds? You know, okay. uh, many people can come to that conclusion. If Abdurrahman Muhammad knew that someone was in prison, was given a life sentence. And I knew, and I knew for a fact that he was innocent, okay? I would do whatever I had to do to you know, try to help that brother, especially when we say, now let me speak as a Muslim, especially when we say that we are Muslim brothers, right? We are Muslim sisters and we believe you know, in this truth and this brotherhood, okay? And you say, you're my brother and you allow me to go to prison and lose my family and lose my children, okay? Uh, you know, that's a moral decision. And that's a, that's a uh, you know, that's what the, the Muslims in Newark are going to have to grapple with. I agree with you, you know, I crossed the line. I knew the line I was crossing when I revealed uh, these people's identity. I knew I was crossing a line and I knew it was dangerous. I, I, I definitely knew that. So I appreciate what you're saying, but it's a moral question, and it's a question of you know, you know, what do we mean when we say the Muslim Brotherhood? You know, and a Muslim is the brother of his of his uh, of his fellow Muslim. You know, and we allow this to happen. You know, that's that's a problem, brother. That's a problem. Yes, uh, thank you so much, and assalamu alaikum, uh, brother uh, Abdurrahman. Uh, uh, brother, I think uh, the question that I had. I think you already were answering it earlier that your uh, your documentary left us on a cliffhanger when you asked that question that could he have been an FBI agent and I'd felt that the documentary never explored it any further and we never got an answer to that question and I think you're saying that we're going to have to wait for more documents to come out before we can have that answer uh, we may and never get the answer we may never get the answer because um, something like that is not going to be in a document. It's going to be the kind of thing where someone got arrested, uh, they were looking at some serious time, and the feds say, hey, look, you know, we both have a problem. You know, you have a problem, and we have a problem. And the problem needs to be handled. If that problem's handled, certain other problems will go away for you. That's how it would go down. So I don't think you know, uh, it will really ever be solved definitively like that. I don't, you know, I would like to think so. 
um, if some family relatives come through and say, yes, you know, my father was working for the feds or what have you, something like that. But uh, that's not something that the government is going to put in a document. There's not going to be a smoking gun like that. Uh, my question was, you said um, the process was really, you know, sketch, not sketchy, but there was a lot to it uh, into getting this on Netflix. So I was just wondering if you could expand on that a little more and like what that process really looked like of, you know, from beginning to end, getting through Netflix. Okay, briefly, let me share this with you. This is the most asked question I've been asked, man, since this thing dropped. How'd you get on Netflix? Man, how'd you get on Netflix? You know, what I would say is this, have a story to tell, okay? Have a story that you believe in or have some research that you really are passionate about and throw yourself into it and do good work and put the work in. And I would say, pay your dues. Everyone wants to know, yo, how can I get on? How can I get on? As if, you know, you just quote unquote, get on. When the truth of the matter is, I did not go to Netflix. I did not go to Art Media. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I didn't go to any of these other outfits that were talking to me before then. PBS Frontline. Uh, you know, 60 Minutes, all these different people have been making promises and what have you. And, you know, they didn't materialize, but I kept right on moving, doing my thing, you know. And what I would say to you is, is you know, do something important and have a, a powerful story to tell or, you know, just a wonderful piece of art that you want to present. And, uh, you know, these people will be, be the pathway to your door. I believe that. Netflix doesn't allow people to solicit them. There's so many gatekeepers, you know, it doesn't work like that, you know? They came to me. If you're doing something important, all right, opportunities will present themselves to you. Okay, oh, let, me, let me answer your question real quick, though. You wanted to, I was doing my, I was doing my thing, okay? I was in a number of nation, uh, nationwide newspapers, important papers, like I said, New York Times, Washington Post, People saw my name and they said, this can't be possible. That this independent guy, he's not at a university, he's not affiliated with any institution, he has no money, that he has exposed the killer of Malcolm X, they couldn't believe it until they investigated it and they found out that, that it was true. And they said that this is a, po a story that's too powerful not to be told. And that's how that happened. So Arc Ar Ar Media came to me, they approached Fusion Television under the leadership of Henry Louis Gates, okay? Fusion purchased it, they produced it. Cable station, not many people saw it. By the time Netflix heard about it, Netflix wanted it first. They bought it from Fusion Television and that's how it you know, came to the big screen. How do you address the, I don't know if it's a rumor or, or whatever that that the brother that you're seeking to exonerate was was there, and there is a photograph that exists uh, with him in the background when Malcolm's being put into the ambulance. And what would that do to the credibility of your efforts to exonerate him? Okay, brother, let me share something with you. Okay, I'm not just I'm just not uh, a, a a guy who deals in documents. I do field research. Okay, I know who the killers are. I know what they did after it happened, okay? Uh, I know people who know them personally, okay? So it's not something like I gotta look at a picture. And this is, I know who the killers are, okay? That's a fact. Um, so I know this whole theory about the picture. I know when it materialized. I know when it developed. I know it's not true, you know? So I don't have to, I'm not worried about you know, my scholarship and, and, and what we've presented, you know, I'm not even worried about that theory. I know it's false. I know when the whole theory developed, it began as a picture and it said, hey, you know, doesn't that look like it could be Butler? And then as the series became more and more acclaimed and successful, then it started becoming more definitive. Oh, that is Butler or Muhammad Abdul Aziz. That is him. And then, oh, the documentary is wrong because we've got this picture of the back of a man, not even his front, the back of a man that looked like Butler. Um, you know, 
I say, let a thousand roses bloom, man. Let a thousand flowers bloom, man. You know, if someone wants to put that out there and defend that, be my guest. Be, I'm not worried about it. I'm not. When you found out that William X. Bradley died, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, ha has the notion ever crossed your mind that, you know, wow, it, it, I'm so close to talking with this man and he happened to die. Um, in your mind, do you, uh, did, did the notion cross your mind that, wow, you know, maybe something might have happened with him, you know, and it happened to him uh, by maybe some powers to be that said it was his time to go? Or did you know how he died? Did you know how he died? I do not know how he died. Okay. Which, which, I, which, and which that was which? never published. I do not know how he died. I will say this, though. He died four days before his 80th birthday. Okay, uh, most black men don't get anything close to 80 years, brother. You know what I'm saying? So he had already outlived the average lifetime of uh, of a black man in America, and okay. that's because he did a lot of push-ups and sit-ups and stuff when he was in prison. He was in boxing. He was in pretty good shape for many years of his life. Um, you know, I don't, I don't like conspiracy theories, and you'll notice you don't find any in this series. You know, that's why we don't make any definitive claims about whether he worked for the feds or not or what have you. We just present, you know, what I found, and we let you come to the conclusion that you want to come to. But I, I don't think there's any reason to get uh, overly conspiratorial. I will say this, though. He knew we were coming. He knew right, we were right. coming. It was getting hot in Newark. Because right. the kind of questions that I was asking, he knew that the rope was getting tighter. And uh, when you get it's old and you say, hey, man, you know, I'm not going to die in prison, man. Right, I'm right, not right. dying in okay. prison. Yeah, I just want to ask you, um, with Thomas, uh, Thomas Hayer, did he ever identify William Bradley as the person that was there that actually did it? Thomas Hayer would, uh, would not participate uh, in the series. Uh, he's quite old himself now and um here's what you should here's what's most significant he's never denied it in mm -hmm. fact no one has denied no one has denied you know my findings uh the the docuseries has been out for months now has created a firestorm in newark new jersey in the muslim community the man has yes, a family yes, he has children and no one has no one has denied, you know, what I've said about him. I, you know, um, I happen to know that uh, Talmadge Hare did see the picture, and Talmadge Hare knows who he is. And uh, we, you know, we don't, you know, we don't, we don't need him to say, "Oh, that's him." We don't need it. We, 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 you know, we, you know, he, he did. He, his position was this: I filed the affidavit. 40 something years ago, or what have you, and I'm washing my hands up. I've done my duty. It's impacted my life in two ways. I mean, the journey to this point, you know, uh, has been, it's been challenging. It's been difficult. Uh, many ups and downs. I'm just a, just a brother like all of us. I go to work, take care of my family, you know, and, um, you know, there were times when the, the, Research was at a quite fast pace, and there were times when it slowed down for a minute. You know, there were times when, you know, I was kind of flush, where I could travel and, you know, do research. And there were times when, you know, I had to attend to other matters, you know. Um, so th there was the journey, okay? And also the success of the series and the acclaim it's received. Obviously, I'm quite gratified and thankful and appreciative that uh, I could make this kind of contribution to the history of our people and to try to get justice, some semblance of justice for Brother Malcolm. We owe this to him. You know, our entire community, the African-American community, we owe this to Malcolm and we owe this to his family to settle this question. We owe him that, grat that debt of gratitude. And, you know, I'm humbled, extremely humbled to have played a role you know, in that. So that's how it's impacted my life. It's, it's you know, it's, it's made me very appreciative.
one thing I, I was interested in watching the documentary was um, obviously the um, the statements that were made by Betty Shabazz and um, and her daughters um, around the involvement of Louis Farrakhan um, in inciting. Uh, the situation that led to the assassination is very well publicised, and obviously that you know there's some messy history there. Um, but there was, wasn't something that was really commented on, uh, and 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 um, you know Louis Farrakhan was kind of missing from the documentary. And I just wondered if you um, could maybe comment on that. Very good question. Absolutely. Uh, the question of Minister Farrakhan and any involvement he may or may not have had in the assassination of Malcolm X, that's already been adjudicated. Um, he's admitted his role in creating an atmosphere of vitriol and hatred against Malcolm. He wrote an article in which he said December of 1964, a man such as Malcolm is worthy of death. He's admitted that. Um, he has over the years bragged about the Nation of Islam taking out Malcolm. He said, if we dealt with him like a nation deals with a traitor, what the hell business is it of yours? He has praised the assassins in different sermons, called them, you know, heroic people and so on and so forth. So that's out there. Now, was he involved in the, you know, the plot to assassinate Malcolm X? We don't have any evidence for that. And the reason this series, let me just say this. The reason this series has been so universally acclaimed and accepted, is finding accepted and lauded, is because we don't deal with conspiracy theories, okay? We don't, uh, we don't deal with speculation or things that are conjectural. We deal with what we can prove. Uh, if we had included Mr. Farrakhan, you know exactly what he would have done. He would have taken all the oxygen out of the room and he would have flamed the series as a polemic against him. And, you know, this is Netflix, the white man coming after him, using this Uncle Tom Negro to come get the minister. We took all that away from him. Now, I will tell you, if I had a document that had his name in it, you best believe he would have been in it. But because I didn't have anything like that, I didn't use it. And I think it was a stroke of genius because it keeps you, you know, uh, gives you a laser focus on exactly what happened. The, uh, my question would be that because we were not able to get that closure that we were looking for, that some semblance of justice could have come to the killer or come for Malcolm by convicting the killer or something of that sort, and we're still waiting on some type of a court decision, what do you offer to us as some closure? Because I felt that ever since the end of that documentary, there's been this void looking for something to do and something to believe in that hasn't been there. And what have you done to find that for yourself? And do you have any other works that you are planning to do as a sequel uh, for this? Okay. Yes. Uh, there is a very strong possibility and there are, you know, discussions of what about season two. Um, you'll notice that uh, we didn't show you the faces of the other assassins. Uh, those faces may be coming forth. Um, I think that there's a closure in knowing what happened, okay? I think that there's a closure in, in a justice in establishing the truth, the, the historical fact, you know, of what happened here. I think that that's the only kind of closure we want to get. And so many people from all over the world have um, thanked me for giving them closure in the sense that there was such a fog and a veil around the assassination of Malcolm X. It was always very um, fuzzy and clouded and we took away that cloud, we took away that veil, and now the world can understand what happened. And uh, we can learn that lesson as we you know, move forward in our struggle to, to not be manipulated by the government that way, to keep our jealousies and our ego in check. Um, but, you know, as, uh, as believers, uh, we believe that there will be justice uh, in some other place and, you know, we'll have to leave it there. That's all we're going to get. 
Well, thank you so much, Brother Muhammad. This has been just amazing.